Lord, as we open up your word and we spend time in there just a little bit this morning, I pray, as always, that Holy Spirit, you would be opening our eyes to the wonderful things that are there. Anywhere that there might be um, verses or words that we, we can't quite understand or comprehend, Lord, I, I pray that you would bring clarity to those. And in the, those, those large components that we just can't wrap our minds fully around, Lord, even if we walk away from here today saying, I, I can't quite grasp that, Lord, may there be praise in our heart that we worship a God who is so much larger than us. That God, that there's, there are going to be those things that we won't always fully comprehend because of how great you are. But I thank you for the things that you reveal to us, that you open our eyes to. And I pray that there would be both of them, both of those taking place for us this morning. I pray that you would be glorified in all of your truth as we read from your word today. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, in connection with what we were reading last night, we were in Romans chapter 4. Over the past two weeks, we've been able to go from verse 1 of Romans 4 all the way to verse 12 last night. And that was a part 1 and a part 2. The footsteps of the faith, part one and part two. So it's it's a theme that's running through all of those verses together. And in connection with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw something out there uh, onto the screen. As a matter of fact, verse fourteen. This is James chapter two, verse fourteen. Listen to these words, keeping in mind what we've been tracking with Paul in Romans. James says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Now, this is an interesting statement in connection with what we've been reading in Romans 4. Paul has been saying it is by faith alone. Faith alone. And then you read these words of James, and it seems that there is this large contradiction with what James is talking about in relation to what Paul has been talking about. It appears like Paul and James are like beta fish being placed in, in the same bowl. And you know what happens if you put two beta fish in one bowl. It's an instant fight. And it, it's, a, it's a hard fight. It's a rough fight. However, for Paul and James being placed into the same book, the Bible, and what may at first glance appear to be a contradiction, there is no fight. There is no theological fight between Paul and James and the words that they are using. I, I want for us to see that, as a matter of fact, what each of them teaches actually coincides with each other. That what one says only brings a fuller picture to what the other is saying as well. Because God's word is free from any kind of contradiction. And we're going to witness just a little bit of that this morning as we go into it. What James is talking about here in verse 14 and the verses that follow that we'll be reading some of. When he speaks about this faith, he's talking about the kind of faith. And that's important. What Paul and James are talking about are two different parts of this same faith. James is talking about the kind of faith a person needs. It can't just be a professed faith, a spoken faith, with no real truth to it. It is possible for someone to say, I, I believe this. I have I place faith in this. And their heart and their mind are actually completely empty of any real faith, of any real true belief. Real faith will always have works because works are the results of real faith. Do you follow that? Yeah. And this is why I put it on the screen because it's one of those you almost need to read through a couple times. Real faith is going to have works. It's going to have deeds. These deeds that James was talking about in verse 14 there. To bring illustration to this, when Jenny and I were first uh, starting to date, we, we had had a couple dates already, and, and uh, 
I took Jenny to a place that I love to go, Forest Falls. There's all kinds of hiking up there, all kinds of trails to hike. But more than the trails, I actually like to go off the trail and, and not just hike, but I like to do some rock climbing and, and climb up the, the walls of, of these mountains, these rock mountains. Because up at the top, you could get to the very top of where the waterfall was dropping off. And the view from up there was amazing. And so, you know, first few dates in, I tell Jenny, I say, hey, I'd like to bring you there with me. Would you be willing to go up the side of the cliff with me if I promise that you're going to be okay? And, and that I'll go right behind you. I know where the footholds are. I'm very confident that nothing bad is going to happen. Now, what you need to know about Jenny is that uh, rock climbing is not her thing. Why? Because she doesn't like heights. <laughs> and heights are involved in rock climbing. So the idea... For Jenny to think about going and climbing up this cliff to get to the top of the waterfall, it wasn't a super exciting thought. Because what if she slipped? What if she fell, right? But she said, well, at the time she thought, she didn't say it yet, I heard later. But at the time she thought, well, I, I do trust Jason. I trust Jason. I, I, I believe that it, with all this confidence he's talking about, like, I'll be okay. So she did the unthinkable for her, and she climbed this rock wall to get to the top of the waterfall. That was true trust on Jenny's heart. That was, in, in, in the illustration of this, that was like having real faith. Because if she stood and she said, you know, I trust you, Jason, but I'm not going to climb up there, then how true would that trust actually have been? Maybe she would want to be trusting, but she's saying, I'm just, I'm not. But the fact that she went through and, and not only said, yeah, I trust you, but she went and she climbed that cliff edge with me demonstrated that real trust. And when I say cliff edge too, I want you all to understand, I wasn't gonna take this, this wonderful lady that I had met on, on some treacherous climb where, it, you know, where she really could get her. I was, I was careful about that. Ends up, we went several times after and had a lot of fun. And every time she would climb up the top of that and, and get to the top of the waterfall with me. And it was just an amazing time. I want that illustration to bring us the picture that faith produces works. Works are the evidence for real faith. James goes on to say, we're going to skip past a couple verses for the sake of time, but he goes on to speak about Abraham. James talks about Abraham with this idea of works and, and of faith, just as Paul has been using Abraham in the book of Romans as this example. So James 2, verses 21 through 23, we're going to read straight through that. It says this, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. I love all of it. I love that last little part. And he was called God's friend. It's awesome to know that we can be called God's friend when we have that faith, that real faith in him. But something else I want us to notice is that just like Paul, again, in Romans chapter 4, quoted a specific verse from Genesis. Genesis 15, verse 6. Look, we'll highlight it here on the screen. Same thing. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Both Paul and James quote Genesis 15, verse 6, which clearly, clearly makes the, the, the statement that it is by faith that we are justified. Not by works, but by faith. But if faith is going to be real then works are going to automatically follow. There's going to be feet to the faith. And so the point that James makes 
is that both Abraham's faith and his deeds were working together. Faith first, and then work came out of that, these deeds. And you notice that uh, it, it says there in verse 22, no, actually verse 21, it says, it talks about Abraham offering his son Isaac. This is an account in Genesis, takes place in Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham is tested. God calls for him to, to, to offer up his, his one and only son, Isaac, on the altar. And as Abraham had the knife uh, over Isaac, ready to, <laughs> to go for it, God calls out and says, Stop right there. Don't do anything. <laughs> you have shown yourself to be faithful, to, to be obedient to me. So James is saying, because of that obedience, Abraham has this righteousness in the Lord. But we've got to understand that if it was only obedience without faith, there would be no righteousness involved in this at all. As a matter of fact, I don't think you would do that if you didn't have faith, right? Faith was an essential part for that kind of obedience for Abraham to demonstrate. And so I, wanna, I want us to see that what, what uh, James is talking about here is this faith that leads to obedience. And we can do this through the timeline. The timeline that we started last night, right here from Genesis 15 to Genesis 17, we, we're, we're going to build off of this. By including now, we'll, we'll condense it, we'll push all of that together, and we're going to include Genesis 22. I've already shared with you what happens in Genesis 22, God's testing of Abraham with his son Isaac, so we'll just pop that right up there, and we see now, we're not just going from chapter 15 to chapter 17, which was that 13 years of, of time spanned between each other, but we're going even further from Genesis 15 all the way to Genesis 22, guess what? I don't know how many years it was, but it was more. It was further than 13 years. Abraham would have been well into his hundreds at this point in time. And so we see with both of the deeds or the works that Abraham demonstrated, both in Genesis 17, his circumcision, and in Genesis 22, his willingness to offer his son on the altar both of those were preceded by Genesis 15, where it again clearly makes the, the statement that he was justified by his faith, by his belief in God. That is where it begins. Faith, real faith, has to bring about feet. It has to bring about action. And so, uh, let's look now, last verse we're going to look at, James 2, verse 24, and it, it says this, you see that a person is justified by what he does, and not by faith alone. There it is again, we come to this verse, which if that's taken out of context, or you don't understand the fuller picture of what James presented above with Genesis 15, 6, and all of this, that can be misunderstood. Because it's not faith plus works to receive justification, to receive salvation. That's like saying, so it's Jesus plus my work earned my salvation for me. That's backwards. That, that, that would not fit the full theme of Scripture all the way through, right? That, that has no fitting to it at all. James is emphasizing that the demonstration of, again, real faith, through its producing of works. And we'll bring it back to that screen with the little quote there, just so we can see that again, this idea that real faith will always have works attached to it. That works, those deeds, demonstrate that the faith is real. If we say we have faith, but there's nothing to show for it, then as James says plenty of times in the book of James, that faith is a dead faith. So we are challenged this morning in this footsteps of the faith to realize that along with faith, church, along with faith, 
becomes obedience. Those deeds will be included. Those deeds are not our merit for salvation, but there are way to live in this life of faith with the Lord. The, the faith comes first, and if it's real faith, it's going to have action. It's going to have feet to it. So as we look at the pattern of faith through Abraham in Romans chapter 4, in James chapter 2, we begin to have this fuller picture realizing that having faith in God doesn't mean you just sit at the sideline and just say, okay, well, I can just I can speak this as much as, oh, I believe God, I believe God, and do nothing about it. No, church, we are to be acting in this faith. Every step of faith we take is a demonstration that we are trusting the living God. And so do you see that for uh, James and for Paul, speaking about faith and speaking about works, they're not like beta fish at all. They don't have a, a theological fight taking place between them. It's not James or just Paul. It's both. Both are books in the Word of God the Word of God has no contradictions. And when we see what may appear to be a contradiction at first, it's pretty amazing how, as you study through it, you begin to realize, oh, that just gave a fuller picture. We're seeing it from different angles and able to see the fuller context of what is being said. And so that is why I wanted to share this with you today out of the context that we're traveling in through Romans 4 together because I thought somebody's going to read the book of James through the time that we're in Romans 4. They're going to read that and they're going to be like, wait a minute, I keep hearing justification is by faith alone and now I'm seeing printed on the pages of James something that seems entirely different. So I thought, I better get there first. <laughs> Clear up any misunderstanding and truly, I, I believe truly, to be able to see the fullness of what it is to have real faith. Always remembering that it is through faith and by God's grace alone that we receive this acceptance from God, this justification, this salvation. But then we get to live in that faith, walking the steps, following demonstrating our obedience to him. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that we would be able to take not only the, the theological points of this today from Romans and from James, but that we would be able to take the application from those passages, Lord, that fuller picture. Lord, I pray for anybody who has been claiming your name, Jesus, claiming faith in you, but it's not a real faith. It's just a profession that, that, that is, is empty in the heart and the mind. Lord, I pray that, that today that would be clear, Lord. That, that anyone in that position would, would hear these words and turn to you with real faith. And Lord, if anyone is struggling to have that real faith, we know the account in the Gospels where the man asked, Lord, he asked you, he said, I, I want to believe, help me with my unbelief. Help me to believe you. Belief even is a gift from you, Lord. And so I, I pray, Father, that um, anyone at that point of wrestling with that, that today there would be victory in that, Lord. That today they would be able to settle in their heart this matter of faith. That they would have real faith faith with action, to follow you, to trust you. And we ask all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Truth.